So like Steve said, my topic is ethics and intentionality in game design. Uh, so here's the agenda for today. I'll start out with some introductions, then I'll go through some dark patterns, trigger warnings, historical trauma, misrepresentation, and finally some conclusions. So before we dive in, Steve already kind of introduced me a little bit, but I'll go a little bit further. Um, I'm Adrian. I work at the University of Toronto at the Knowledge Media and Design Institute as a researcher on games accessibility. I'm currently building an accessible gaming space at the Faculty of Information, which we're hoping to open up next spring, virus permitting. If that interests you and you want to get involved, don't hesitate to reach out. In addition, I co-teach a course on inclusive and accessible design, which is brand new this year. I also work as an inclusive education advocate at the University of Toronto, working with professors, administrators, and students to make the post-secondary environment more accessible to incorporate accessibility into the course curriculum so that the university is training professionals with accessible design already in their toolkit. My identity information might help contextualize this talk. So I have anxiety, OCD, and a dissociation disorder. These all factor into sources of harm I experience from the game industry. I also want to mention that in this talk, I'm going to mention portrayals of mental health challenges, suicidality, institutionalization, ableism, and violence. If any of these pose a risk to you, please take care of yourself first. On these slides are a list of resources if you need some, if you, if you feel like you need some support. www.takethis.org and checkpointorg.com are both specifically for gamers, so I highly recommend them. Also, if you feel uncomfortable at any time, feel free to dip, I won't be offended. In the last few years, game accessibility has made huge leaps and bounds, as evidenced by all of you being here today. More people than ever can play games, and good thing too, what else would we do with ourselves in 2020? We would all end up making more sourdough than the world could consume. Although the progress made in accessible gaming is undeniable, I don't think it's time for us to rest on our laurels, because no matter how good our subtitles, how innovative our adaptive hardware, how effective our low vision modes, all that may get us closer to building accessible games, but it only scratches the surface of making inclusive games. It can't be enough for our players to be able to play the game. Access isn't enough. We want to create an environment where the players can truly feel included and maximize their fun. An environment that doesn't hurt the player or alienate them. Pictured on the screen is a scene from Celeste, where the playable character experiences a panic attack. One of the most powerful aspects of games is agency of the player. Games are one of the only art forms that allow the audience to create an emergent narrative, the story of their own experience as they play the game. This agency is a big part of what makes games special, and it can be a powerful tool for unpacking trauma, healing, or experiencing empathy. However, all these things can also make games traumatic and harmful to players. Without proper support or forewarning for players, games can become harmful and even dangerous. As game designers, it is our responsibility to minimize that harm to the best of our ability. I'll touch on four main sources of harm, dark patterns, trigger warnings, historical trauma, and misrepresentation. There are several others and undoubtedly some I'm completely unaware of. I'm still constantly being educated on this subject and I believe I will never stop learning. So let's jump in. The first source of harm I'll touch on will be familiar to any of you who attended my talk on dark patterns at camp in May. I'm starting with dark patterns because believe it or not, it is the least complex source of harm we'll talk about. Dark patterns are common choices made by designers that benefit the design owners, but hurt the user often without their knowledge. Dark patterns can take advantage of the player in four main ways, monetary, temporal, social, and psychological. Monetary dark patterns are anything that causes the player to spend more money than they planned or than they can afford. Loot boxes are a good example of this. There's also scarcity, which is when the game makes it items seem rare by proclaiming there is a limited quantity. But if you think about it, there are actually unlimited supplies of virtual items. 
Temporal dark patterns are anything that wastes the player's time in an unhealthy way or cause them to drastically mismanage their time. For example, quests that you can only play at certain times of day, say 2 to 4 p.m., that could cause somebody to miss a meeting or something else important. Social dark patterns leverage players' connections to other people in harmful ways. Social pyramid schemes, such as invite three friends and adding your contacts list are common patterns. Psychological dark patterns offer a wide variety of patterns, but the most common ones are user shaming, which is making fun of players who choose not to purchase something and psychological manipulation, like putting a crying puppy that you can save by making a purchase. Many people would say that there is nothing wrong with this. It's a little dastardly, but no real harm done. Now think about somebody with extreme anxiety or somebody having slight mania. A situation with fabricated scarcity can be horribly triggering for them and cause lasting harm. Or think about loot boxes. Someone with a gambling addiction or difficulties with executive functioning could spend devastating amounts of money trying to get the big win. What about games that require you to add your friends and invite new people to the game? For people with social anxiety, they would just have to stop playing the game. For people who may not realize social consequences of blasting their whole contact list, they could create strain with their friends. How can you avoid harming your players with dark patterns? The biggest action you can take is transparency with your players. If there is a loot box in your game, tell them the real odds of success. Don't give them a timer to complete a purchase if there's no need to put a time pressure on them. Additionally, provide ways to achieve items through gameplay as well as capital. If the player can get to the next level by adding a friend, they should also be able to level up through persistent gameplay. The next type of harm I'll go into is lack of trigger warnings. There are a lot of moments in games that are supposed to be provocative or shocking. Many players want to be surprised by sudden scares or explore characters' traumas deeply, but there are plenty of players with pre-existing traumas who can be triggered by these moments. Last year, I played the game what became of Edith Finch. It's a really clever game that tells the story of a family who all had various mental health struggles and most died in various ways. The game obviously incorporates a wide variety of potential triggers. I made sure I was in a good state of mind while playing and even played with another person in the room. What I wasn't prepared, prepared for was the extremely visceral experience of playing a character who dissociates and then dies by suicide. The game makes you play through the scene and at first you don't realize what's going on. I ended up having a big dissociative episode triggered by this scene and was extremely vulnerable for days afterwards. There was no warning before the level that there was going to be a depiction of suicide or dissociation, and I was caught unawares with no supports from the game. There are lots of scenarios that necessitate trigger warnings. Here are just a sample. Panic attacks, of course, also abuse from partners, parents, strangers, and more. Violence, now many games, this is a given. In fact, it probably says violence on the cover of the game right next to the ESRB rating. But for some forms of violence, such as violence stemming from identity discrimination or unexpected violence, there should be forewarning. Gore, again, this is likely in the ESRB rating, but nonetheless could necessitate a trigger warning, particularly for gore that is focused around sexualized body parts or prolonged gore. Also mental health issues such as eating disorders, anxiety, self-harm, all of these can lead to relapses and cause significant trauma. There's also gaslighting, which is where somebody is manipulated by convincing them that they're crazy. Finally, discrimination. This could be based on race, gender, culture, or ability, lots of other things. Lack of trigger warnings can cause lasting effects to your players. Someone whose bulimia was in remission could witness a triggering scene and have their first episode in years, or someone with PTSD could have a panic attack from unexpected gore. As mentioned earlier, the solution for this problem is more controversial. You certainly don't want a black screen with the words content advisory before every cutscene that has blood in it. 
and most players don't need those trigger warnings. My suggestion to this problem aligns with many other access solutions. Make it a setting and let people know. Here's an example. When the game first loads, the player sees a prompt to check trigger warnings. If they are serious about spoilers and feel safe proceeding without content warnings, they can do so. If they open the trigger warning settings, they can see the different triggers that are present in the game and turn on warnings for each of them. There should also always be an option to skip a cutscene, and the player should still be able to glean vital information through text or audio afterwards. For example, if there is a scene with assault and the character discusses the whereabouts of the big boss in it, the player should receive that information regardless of if they feel comfortable watching the cutscene. You can also incorporate solutions for the player into the game. In the game Celeste, Madeline, the main character, literally has a second spirit that separates from her and represents her anxiety. When Madeline has a panic attack, the game should have some kind of trigger warning. But what it does do well is incorporate a well-documented coping mechanism for anxiety right into the game. To manage her panic attack, Madeline is told to picture a feather floating up and down and match her breathing with it. The player also sees a feather on the screen and can follow the breathing. This gives the player scaffolding to get through the scene. Next up is practices that perpetuate historical trauma. Now, I am not suggesting that video games should never tackle historical issues, but some games will show violence or prejudice through historical retellings in a way that can be deeply harmful. I've heard the argument that discriminatory behavior and violence was a part of that era and just how they talked then. That argument central, centralizes privileged groups at the heart of the narrative and erases the trauma that comes from historical discrimination. Historical traumas can include colonialism, slavery, segregation, but I'm going to focus on institutionalization and the crazy woman trope because my expertise is in disability issues and because of my white settler identity. The trope of the haunted insane asylum has been done this times. On screen is a scene from mental asylum. This of course stems from the history of mental institutions and criminal treatment of people with disabilities and cognitive differences. The asylums and games are pictured as dark grimy places with metal beds and caged residents. It's so horrifying, most people don't even consider the possibility that it could be tied to reality. As many of you in the disability rights world know, the reality of institutions was not that distant. And while today we don't have official institutions, abuse in group homes and similar care facilities is still rampant. These games also portray residents as the asylums as beasts and demons. Part of the horror is encountering patients who are chained to the walls or locked in isolation rooms. This makes it seem like people who were living in institutions were dangerous and barely human. The assumption that people with mental health challenges are somehow more likely to be violent and therefore cannot live in the community still exists and is mirrored in these games. The reality is that people with disabilities are much more likely to be the victims of violent crimes and the villainization of mental health illness is deeply dangerous. You'd think that these tropes are a thing of past games. It's 2020 after all, but no. In production is yet another game titled Asylum that falls into the same habits of tonelessly portraying institutions as horror tropes. What's really important in this type of game is thinking about where the camera is pointed. Some of the biggest issues with these types of games is they look at marginalized people through a lens of assumptions and biases. Portraying the dark parts of history is important, but needs to be done with the perspective of the people who are most hurt. Pictured on screen is a scene from The Town of Light, one of the only asylum games that isn't 100% problematic. Instead of being told from the perspective of somebody making a documentary about an abandoned asylum and getting murdered by ghosts, it's actually told from the perspective of a former resident. The character revisits the asylum where she was forced to live, and the horror of the story 
are the experiences she endured while there. Because the really scary part about asylums is not the people who lived in them, but the system of oppression that created them. Now let's look at historically crazy women. Pictured on screen is the most obvious one, Harley Quinn from the Batman series, or you could think of Alma from Fear. There are countless others as the trope of the crazy woman has gone back centuries as a way to control women. A common practice used to be that when women would act out against their husbands or fathers, a psychiatrist would deem them hysterical and say that they were out of their minds. This practice continues today in the form of gaslighting, convincing women that they are crazy and should therefore give some of their autonomy over to men. Or sometimes use for why a woman turns down someone who is romantically interested in her. Women do experience mental health challenges, but it doesn't make them out of control or unable to take care of themselves. Games have a bad habit of making instability the reason why the player should fear a female antagonist. It's okay to have female villains. In fact, it would be great to see more but make them intimidating because they are powerful, not because they're crazy. Closely related to the practice of harmful portrayals of historical discrimination is harmful misrepresentation. People with disabilities, particularly those with mental health complications are commonly cast as villains in popular media. Many people think that those with mental illnesses are dangerous since news media will highlight perpetrators mental illness if the individual has a diagnosis but will never mention when the perpetrator does not. People with disabilities are in fact only responsible for an average of 3% of violent crimes, whereas they represent 20% of the general population. In contrast, people with disabilities are also 10 times more likely to be the victims of violent crime than average. The game industry has begun to incorporate mental health issues in games more and more, resulting in really mindful portrayals and analogies of mental health. However, the majority of positive characters with mental health issues have diagnoses which are somewhat privileged. Anxiety, depression, and PTSD are all extremely important mental health challenges that many people face, but they have become somewhat acceptable to discuss publicly. Other mental health challenges such as psychosis, dissociation, schizophrenia, and bipolar are still wrought with stigma. For example, the game Life is Strange does a beautiful job in many ways of representing diversity. It even looks at issues of abuse and depression with grace. However, one of the game's villains is a teen boy who bullies and is violent against other characters. Come to find out, he's actually diagnosed with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia, which could be used as a tool to show that he is complex and multidimensional. Instead, the game breezes over it and his diagnoses are instead used as a way to show the player that this boy is dangerous. This kind of representation, when subsections of a stigmatized group are chosen for representation, is called trickle-down privilege. The idea is that you choose the most palatable members of a marginalized community, such as people with anxiety, and grant them rights. And then the next group down will become more palatable once the audience has grown used to the first. Why should it be okay to show protagonists struggling with depression, but as soon as a character has a dissociative disorder, they are portrayed as crazy and dangerous? It takes too long for privilege to trickle down, and the longer it takes, the more marginalized people experience harm. It can also have the effect of trivializing or overnormalizing depression, suicide, and anxiety. Because these mental health barriers are now much more common in media, creators may forget that there are still very serious and scary experiences and require proper support for the player. All mental health challenges need to be treated seriously. The last thing I want to come from this talk is for game designers to shy away from mental health and disability representation. It is so important to show the wide diversity of humanity in all forms of media. But there is a difference between throwing a character with mental health complications or disability for the sake of representation and true thoughtful character diversity. It is also vital to provide scaffolding and support for players. Practicing good representation is complex, but there are some things that you can do to get on the right track. First is research. Pictured on screen is Senua from Hellblade, who is portrayed as having psychosis. The team at Ninja Theory did in-depth research to properly represent Senua's experience. 
On the right is pictured Charisse from Marvel's Avengers, who is based on Cherry Thompson, an incredible accessible gaming advocate. If you're going to include historical portrayals or homages to historical events, make sure you have understanding of all perspectives and people affected by the events. If you're going to have a character with a disability, consult people with lived experience, or better yet, bring them on the team. The best research is always first person research, which the accessibility community knows well. Before bringing in consultants though, make sure you do research to know how to discuss triggers, trauma, and other things with grace. If possible, ask somebody on your team who has some amount of mental health training or education. Research needs to happen at the very beginning of the design process and needs to continue throughout development. Check in with your experts and make sure you are headed in the right direction. You also need to reflect on your own biases and beliefs around stereotypes. What experiences have you had or media you've seen that may have influenced those biases and beliefs? There's a framework in ethical philosophy called reflective equilibrium. This is a process where every time you need to make a decision, you reflect and revise your beliefs. Write out rules based on those beliefs. For example, one rule could be that highly emotional story beats create an engaging narrative, but another rule could be that hyper-emotional portrayals of mental health issues can be triggering. And yet another could be that accurate representation is a priority. Now, examine why do you have these rules? Maybe your first rule is from a class on effective storytelling and the instructor emphasized the need for a climax. Your second rule could be from a friend who experiences depression and you've seen them relapse after watching a triggering movie. Some of your beliefs may seem iffy and may be out of date based on your current beliefs. You may need to rethink your perspectives based on uncovered biases. Now weigh the importance of each of those rules and try to see if there's a solution where all three can be met at a level according to their weight. In this solution, you could decide that a climactic moment in a game about depression has a scene where the character discusses their plans for suicide. You need to consult with suicide experts and people with lived experience of depression. And then you might include a trigger warning pop-up before the scene starts and offer the player an opportunity to skip it without consequence. Finally, think about what the representation brings to the game. When you are planning representation, consider, does it feel integral or superficial? Superficial is okay, but it needs to be done appropriately as well. A superficial representation could be having antipsychotic pills in a character's medicine cabinet or a business card for a therapist in your character's wallet. Pictured on screen are a few medicine bottles that you can find in Life is Strange. Casual representation has power. Contrast that with mentioning that a character is bipolar and then not representing that in their actions or worse, misrepresenting in a way that confirms stereotypes. Make sure your representation beliefs uh, benefit those you are portraying as well as your game's storyline. Games have power. Their art, play, experiential, and hands-on. 2.5 billion people worldwide identify as gamers. We have an opportunity here and a responsibility. For those 2.5 billion people, game designers are responsible for providing a fun, engaging experience, but also for ensuring that they are not causing harm to their players. The too long didn't read version of how to do minimize harm is, don't use dark patterns. Be transparent and honest with your players. Their loyalty to you is more important than making an extra buck. Be mindful of triggers. Acknowledge sensitive material in your game. Give players an opportunity to know what and where the sensitive material is and give them tools to bypass it. Finally, have representation and do it mindfully. Really think about why representation in your game is important and who it affects. Engage with communities and professionals. Ask questions and listen. It's an incredibly exciting time to be an accessibility champion in the gaming world. I want to caution us though, that accessibility is not the end game. Even if we were to make it such that every single person could play every new release, which of course is impossible, we haven't actually included everyone. 
The game goal should not be, can everyone play, but rather, does everyone have a fantastic time playing and want to come back? Um, I've left quite a bit of time for questions. Um, so Steve, if you have any from chat um, or if people want to reach out to me, it's at calamity underscore Jane 95. And you can also find me on LinkedIn. Adrian, thank you so much for, uh, for that talk. Um, I'm really, I definitely learned a lot. This is something that um, myself, I'm kind of, I'll fully even admit, I, it's, it's an area of inclusivity that I don't know about. Um, and I, I'm, fully, I'm fully aware of, of just how much uh, I didn't know. And so the, your talk definitely um, provided a lot of insight for that. Um, so I guess my first question is, in that is, um, how can um, advocates and, uh, and us with, even within the chat, like how can we sort of champion uh, inclusivity in gaming um, in general, whether it's just uh, through social media or um, when we have the opportunity to be able to talk to uh, developers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing is uh, just making sure that the full range of human diversity is represented. So if there's a reason for a character to have a mental health illness, then make sure that that's properly represented. You can also bring up to developers when you think that there should be a trigger warning, say that there is a scene that seems like it might handle mental health poorly or might be triggering for some populations, let them know and make sure that they're aware of the danger that goes along with that. Awesome. Um, so what? So the question that I have is, um, of course, yes, like, like you had mentioned, having be, uh, that kind of representation or at least uh, the consultants um, early on will definitely help sort of um, create those uh, more inclusive experiences. But uh, for, for us, if we do see uh, something in, in games that um, um, may not be uh, as inclusive as, as, we, as we would want it to, what would sort of be the best way to uh, talk to developers after the fact, um, after the game kind of has come out and, um, and we see sort of some of these uh, uh, either trigger uh, warnings or anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you see that there needs to be a trigger warning somewhere in the game and it's not present, then that's something that might need to be put out with release information. So now we're seeing more and more that games are being put out with accessibility information built into the release information, which is really exciting. Um, but it could also be something where trigger warnings could be incorporated in release information. So say if there's a scene of suicide, then along with information like there's going to be really great subtitles in this game, it could also say that it could be a triggering game for somebody who experiences suicidal tendencies. Awesome. Um, so we actually have a question from uh, from chat from uh, from Garrett. Uh, should there be guidelines uh, like this that are the same for broadcasters? Uh, Cherry even points out that they are mostly for age uh, related, but um, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think absolutely. Um, the severity and vulnerability of people who need trigger warnings and um, have been misrepresented in media is greatly understated, I think. And a lot of the responsibility goes to the person to self-regulate. Um, this is true for dark patterns as well, um, that the person absorbing the media or going on websites has the responsibility of making sure that they're safe but it should really be the person creating that content to make sure that they're taking care of their audience. Awesome. Um, another question that came from the chat is uh, uh, also as a more of a clarification, um, can you be able to please share the uh, discord for mental health support? Uh, unfortunately, that was uh, covered up via the ASL. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I will, there's a ton that I will pop into the chat. Um, and, uh, Hopefully that can be pushed on to, to everybody. Um, there's a ton of really great ones. Um, there are uh, discords specifically for gamers with disabilities. There's also a bunch of um, non-for-profits that are also really fantastic. Uh, 